Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Hacker community. Welcome back for day seven of Hope 2020. A big shout out to all the attendees, presenters, and volunteers who make this virtual version of our conference so successful. Thank you, we couldn't be here without you. We have another incredible series of talks and workshops lined up for you today. Our first session today is from George Mashkey, the co-founder of antipolygraph.org, a nonprofit public interest website dedicated to exposing fraud and abuse and the use of polygraphs and lie detectors. His talk today is on polygraph tests and how to beat them, in which he will discuss the scientific shortcomings of polygraphs, why they pose a threat to innocent test takers, and give us some tips and tricks for beating one. Remember, at the end of George's talk, we'll have a QA session with George, and you can submit your questions in Matrix chat window. All right, George, take it away. Good morning, Hope 2020. I'm George Mashkey, and I'm a co-founder of antipolygraph.org, a nonprofit public interest website dedicated to exposing and ending waste, fraud, and abuse associated with the use of polygraphs and other purported lie detectors. I'm a former US Army interrogator and Arabic linguist, and a former reserve intelligence officer with experience in counterterrorism. I'm also a victim of the polygraph, and it is my sincere hope that you will not become one too. Employees and contractors of such federal agencies as the CIA, NSA, and FBI, to name a few, are subject to pre-employment polygraph screening, and then, after they're hired, they're subject to periodic polygraph screening throughout their careers. In particular, uh, those seeking government employment or employment through a contractor uh, in the information technology field are likely to be subjected to polygraph screening. Unfortunately, many honest and well-qualified applicants end up being falsely branded as liars by their government, and they suffer long-term severe career harm as a result. In recent years, the polygraph has also been used to discourage whistleblowing. Uh, those who are currently working for the US government in positions that require periodic polygraph screening are being asked about any media contacts. So how did the polygraph come to play such a prominent role in US government employment policy? We'll explore that question and we'll also discuss techniques that you can use to protect yourself against the risk of wrongly failing the polygraph. These techniques are called polygraph countermeasures and while they can be used by truthful people to protect themselves, they can also be used by liars to beat the polygraph. Despite long-standing broad scientific consensus that polygraph testing has no scientific basis, it has been embraced by the intelligence, military, and law enforcement arms of the US federal government. In 2020, it's fair to say that polygraphy is the official pseudoscience of the United States government. The federal government operates the country's largest polygraph school, which is now called the National Center for Credibility Assessment at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Before that, it was called the Defense Academy for Credibility Assessment, and before that, the uh, Department of Defense Polygraph Institute. And despite its long association with the Defense Department in the United States, uh, it actually trains polygraph operators for all federal agencies with polygraph programs. Apart from training all federal polygraph operators, the National Center for Credibility Assessment also controls the budget for all federal polygraph research. This uh, creates a conflict of interest because the polygraph operators who run the school are not particularly interested in any research that would call into question their methods and practices. It's kind of like having the tobacco industry in charge of cancer research. The origins of polygraphy in America can be traced back to William Moulton Marston, who studied psychology and law at Harvard University, and in 1915 began experimenting with a blood pressure cuff in an attempt to detect lies. His techniques were not particularly successful and were rejected by the US courts, uh, and uh, 
we've at antipolygraph.org published his FBI file where there's an annotation that he's a phony and a crackpot. Nonetheless, his ideas inspired a student at the University of California, Berkeley, to look into expanding on these techniques. John Augustus Larson studied medicine at the University of California at Berkeley and upon graduation entered the Berkeley Police Department. There, he assembled the first polygraph instrument which combined the blood pressure cuff that Marston used with pneumograph tubes that went around a person's chest to record breathing. And unlike Marston's test, the readings were recorded on paper so they could be reviewed later. Larson devised his polygraph instrument with the approval of Berkeley Police Chief August Fulmer, who's considered the father of modern policing in America. However, it was Leonard Keeler who worked with Larson who was the first to build a practical and portable polygraph instrument. Here we see Keeler with his first polygraph instrument, which he built in Los Angeles. He later moved to Chicago where he opened the first polygraph school and he trained the federal government's first polygraph operators. Interestingly, the FBI used the polygraph for the first time in an espionage investigation in 1938 to interrogate a Nazi German spy named Ignaz Theodor Griebel. Because the agents investigating were confident that he was cooperating with them based on his polygraph results, they relaxed supervision of him, enabling him to escape to Germany by ship. Another important figure in the history of polygraphy is John E. Reed, who also of Chicago, who devised what's called the controlled question test in polygraphy, the most common technique used today. And we'll talk about that technique a bit later. Reed also devised the Reed technique of interrogation, which has been widely taught to law enforcement, intelligence, and military personnel in the United States, and which is believed to be responsible for numerous false confessions. Cleve Baxter is credited with starting the CIA's polygraph program in 1948, but he didn't stay long at the CIA. He left and started his own polygraph school, and he devised a numerical system of polygraph chart scoring that was adopted by the Federal Polygraph School and indeed by polygraph operators across the country. He also became a pop celebrity in the 1960s for his claims that he had discovered through his polygraph instrument that plants can read human thought. CIA intelligence officer Aldrich Hazen Ames was arrested in 1994 and charged with spying for the Soviet Union and Russia. During the time that he was committing espionage, he passed the polygraph twice. In response to this, the CIA had a crackdown where they graded polygraph charts much more harshly, sidelining the careers of many employees, but not finding any spies. Somehow, in response to the Ames case, the FBI became convinced that it would be a good idea to mandate polygraph screening of applicants for employment. And so since 1994, all FBI agents hired have had to pass a pre-employment polygraph. In a 2000 letter to Stephen Aftergood of the Federation of American Scientists, Ames wrote, the US is, so far as I know, the only nation which places such extensive reliance on the polygraph. It has gotten us into a lot of trouble. In 1997, Dr. Drew Richardson, then the FBI's senior scientific expert on polygraphs, testified against polygraphy to a subcommittee of the United States Senate. Dr. Richardson testified that polygraph screening is completely without any theoretical foundation and has absolutely no validity. 
The diagnostic value of this type of testing is no more than that of astrology or tea leaf reading. In 2002, the National Research Council, an arm of the National Academy of Sciences, published an exhaustive review of the scientific evidence on polygraphs. The National Research Council's key conclusion was that polygraph testing's accuracy in distinguishing actual or potential security violators from innocent test takers is insufficient to justify reliance on its use in employee security screening in federal agencies. Federal agencies with polygraph screening programs completely disregarded the recommendations of the National Research Council. They not only continued their polygraph screening programs, but they greatly expanded them in the aftermath of 9-11. In 2016, Brian R. Morris, then a Department of Defense polygraph operator, said in remarks to the Federalist Society at the South Texas College of Law, I got the number of internal exams that the DOD ran whether they're applicants or current employees trying to maintain their security clearance, from May 2010 to April 2011, over 43,000 internal exams. That's pre-Edward Snowden. Post-Edward Snowden, that number has tripled. In the aftermath of 9-11, as polygraph screening has expanded, the failure rates have also gone up. At this time, Failure rates on the order of 50 to 70 percent are not unusual in federal agencies. Uh, it's gotten to the point that even retired FBI polygraph operator John Sullivan wrote in an article published in 2017, speaking of the CIA's uh, polygraph uh, program, an honest subject has no better chance than a dishonest subject of getting through the process. Sometimes, in order to demonstrate that the emperor is truly naked, it is necessary to describe his genitalia. Let's take a look at the naked truth behind polygraphy. Polygraph testing is actually based on trickery, not science. The polygraph operator deceives or attempts to deceive the subject in certain ways that are not commonly known by the public. But if you learn the methodology, it turns out it's fairly easy to fool the polygraph. I'll teach you how. Most importantly, you need to realize that the test is an interrogation in disguise. Polygraph tests are divided into three phases, the pretest, the in-test, and the post-test. There are three major polygraph techniques used by the federal government for applicant and employee screening. Uh, due to time constraints, I'm going to limit myself in the teaching of countermeasures to one technique, uh, that which is used by federal law enforcement agencies such as the FBI, the DEA, and the U.S. Secret Service. It's called the Law Enforcement Pre-Employment Test, or LAPET. During the pretest phase of the polygraph, the operator will attempt to establish a rapport with the subject. This is important because it helps to encourage admissions, which is what the polygraph test is really all about. Second, the operator will review the polygraph questions with the subject. Every question that's asked in the next phase, the in-test phase, will be reviewed beforehand. And finally, in the pretest phase, the operator will attempt to impress the subject with how accurate the polygraph is uh, through a device that's called the stimulation or stim test, also known as an acquaintance test. In the stim test, the operator directs the subject to choose a number and then to deny having chosen that number as the operator reads off a series of numbers, including the chosen number. The operator then attempts to convince the subject that he or she reacted strongly when denying having chosen that number. In the pretest, you can also expect to be asked about any past polygraphs you may have sat for. Think about it. If polygraphy were a scientifically valid test, why would it matter at all if you'd been polygraphed in the past? You can also expect to be questioned about whether you've researched polygraphy. Again, if it was a scientific test, why would that matter? 
and you can expect to be read or asked to read a countermeasure statement. Here is a sample countermeasure statement. It is not uncommon for people who have to take a polygraph examination to research information on the topic. Often, they come across sites or read articles that suggest they have to perform some activity to help them through their polygraph examination. Such sites and articles often provide bogus information. In fact, when people attempt to influence the outcome of their polygraph examination in various ways, such activity reveals that they have abdicated their responsibility to tell the truth and are being non-cooperative. Can I count on you not to involve yourself in such activity? There are three main types of questions that you'll be asked while you're connected to the polygraph instrument. These are called relevant, irrelevant, and control or comparison questions. These are the relevant questions asked during the federal government's law enforcement pre-employment polygraph test. These are the questions that they really want to know the answers to. And they're divided into two phases. The first one about national security, the other is our so-called lifestyle questions. So the phase one questions. One, have you been involved in espionage or terrorism against the US? Two, have you damaged any United States government information or defense systems? Three, have you had any unauthorized foreign contacts? And phase two, which will be a separate chart collection, are you withholding information about committing a serious crime? Are you intentionally withholding any information about your involvement with illegal drugs? And three, did you deliberately falsify any information on your application forms? The in-test phase will also include irrelevant questions. These are examples from the law enforcement pre-employment test. Are you sitting down? Is today Monday? Are the lights on in this room? Is this the month of July? Are you now in New York? The operator will tell the subject that the purpose of these questions is to show what their responses look like when they're telling the truth. But in fact, these irrelevant questions are not scored at all, and they merely serve as buffers between pairs of relevant and control or comparison questions, which we'll talk about next. One of the biggest deceptions in polygraphy the lie behind the lie detector, if you will, is the function of the so-called probable lie control or comparison questions. These are questions that the polygraph operator secretly expects everyone is going to lie to. Examples of probable lie control questions taken from the law enforcement pre-employment test include, did you ever take credit for someone else's work? Did you ever lie about someone behind his or her back? Did you ever cheat in school? Did you ever cheat in sports? Did you ever cheat at cards? Did you ever lie to anyone you considered to be a friend? Did you ever spread gossip about anyone you considered to be a friend? Did you ever spread gossip about a coworker? Did you ever cheat on any academic assignment while in school? Did you ever lie to a supervisor you previously worked for? The polygraph operator will compare your reaction to these control questions with your reaction to the relevant questions. If you react more strongly to the control questions, you pass. However, if your reaction to the relevant questions is stronger, then you fail. If this methodology seems overly simplistic to you, you're right, it is. It has no grounding in the scientific method. The key to passing the polygraph will be to make no disqualifying admissions and to exhibit stronger reactions to the control questions than to the relevant questions. Let's take a look now at the polygraph attachments that are going to be connected to you during the in-test phase of the polygraph procedure. These are pneumograph tubes, uh, which will go around your uh, torso and abdomen, and uh, they will measure your breathing. This is a finger plate set. There are two of these. Uh, and they're attached typically to the ring finger and uh, index finger. And they measure differences in conductivity or resistance uh, as a function of Palmer sweating. So they're watching you perspire with this. The third major component is the cardio cuff, 
which is typically placed around the arm opposite the hand with the electrodes or finger plates attached. The polygraph operator will tell the subject that this is to measure blood pressure, but it really doesn't do that. In order to measure blood pressure, you have to let the pressure out of the cuff. Polygraph operators keep the cuff inflated during the whole chart collection, and it's measuring something that is not defined in medicine. And there's no medical test where the cardio cuff is used in this way. Uh, but it produces a tracing that will go up and down, and polygraph operators use this to uh, discern reactions and make inferences about whether a person has spoken the truth or not. Here is a sample portion of a polygraph chart taken from an actual polygraph test conducted by U.S. Customs and Border Protection. On this chart, each vertical line represents five seconds in time, and the gray bars into going the vertical gray bars, those indicate the time period during which a question has been asked. And um, the blue tracings, the pair of blue tracings that you see towards the top of the chart, those are the pneumographic tubes measuring breathing. The green tracing is the electrodermal uh, tracing based on the finger plates. And the red tracing towards the bottom of the screen is the output of the cardio cuff. Again, showing something which is not blood pressure that's not defined in medicine. Uh, it also does indicate accurately heart rate. And you'll also notice at the top and very bottom of the charts, there are two black tracings. Those are from motion uh, sensing pads that uh, have been placed on the seat of the polygraph chair and under the subject's feet. And that's to, used in an attempt to detect any motion that a person might engage in in an attempt to uh, alter the outcome of the polygraph. The polygraph countermeasures that I'll be explaining to you do not entail any kind of motion that would be detected by these sensor pads. So following the pretest phase, which culminates with the STEM test, where you're connected to the polygraph and asked to select a number and deny having chosen it, to be impressed by how accurate the polygraph is in detecting the number that you chose, the in-test will begin. This is where the real questions that they're going to be scoring are asked. And we'll look, take a look at a sample question sequence from the in-test for the law enforcement pre-employment test. Here you see a list of nine questions that would be asked during a single chart collection for phase one of the law enforcement pre-employment test. The first question is always an irrelevant question. Are you sitting down? Yes, it's not scored. The second question is relevant, but it's characterized as a sacrifice relevant question. It's considered that since it's the first relevant question, the subject might show a reaction to it simply by virtue of it being the first relevant question. It's not scored, but they ask uh, concerning national security issues, do you intend to answer each question truthfully? The expected answer is yes. Then uh, the first control or comparison question is asked. Before an arbitrary date, typically uh, the time of the subject's application for employment, did you ever lie about something important? No is the expected answer. Next comes question four, the first relevant question. Have you been involved in espionage or terrorism against the US? The expected answer is no. That's followed by a comparison or control question prior to date. Did you ever cheat anyone out of anything? Again, the expected answer is no. And then that's followed by an irrelevant question. Is today whatever the day of the week is? And the expected answer will be yes. Again, that question is not scored. It's just a buffer between this comparison question and the coming relevant question number six. Have you damaged any United States government information or defense systems? Again, the expected answer is no. Followed by another control or comparison question before date, did you ever lie to cover something up? Again, the expected answer is no. Eight, another relevant question. Have you had any unauthorized foreign contacts? Expected answer, no. 
and nine, uh, the final question, a comparison or control question. Did you ever lie about someone behind his or her back? And again, the expected answer is no. So again, I explained this a bit earlier, but the test is scored by comparing reactions to the relevant questions with reactions to the control questions. If reactions to the control questions are stronger, the subject passes. If reactions to the relevant questions are stronger, the subject fails. The precise criteria used for scoring polygraph charts and for assessing the magnitude of various reactions is documented in a National Center for Credibility Assessment document titled Test Data Analysis Numerical Evaluation Scoring System. And you can get this document if you're interested from antipolygraph.org. It's on our Document Vault page. After scoring the polygraph charts, the polygraph operator will go into the post-test phase. If you pass, you typically won't be told that you passed, but you'll be told that you're done with and you'll be dismissed and they'll tell you that you'll hear about the results later. If you fail, however, you can expect to be subjected to a post-test interrogation. In a post-test interrogation, the polygraph operator will confront the subject with the outcome and press for an admission or a confession. Polygraph operators are trained in a variety of techniques for encouraging admissions. Uh, primarily, uh, they attempt to minimize the importance of the behavior uh, regarding which they're seeking an admission or a confession. One common technique that has been used especially by NSA polygraph operators is to tell the subject that he can admit to anything at all except for murder. That if he's committed murder, he can leave the room. There's no point in proceeding further, but anything else will stay in the polygraph room and won't be uh, told anywhere else. Of course, that's not true, and admissions of crim criminal behavior may result in a referral to law enforcement. For more on the variety of uh, interrogation tactics that are taught at the National Center for Credibility Assessment, see their interview and interrogation handbook, which is available for download at the antipolygraph.org document vault page. Let's now turn to polygraph countermeasures and how to pass or beat a polygraph test. First, if you've been accused of a crime and law enforcement wants you to take a polygraph, you should refuse. It would be foolhardy to go into a polygraph interrogation with a plan to beat it. The reason is that police often use the polygraph as a pretext for interrogating a suspect in the absence of legal counsel. The outcome can be a predetermined part of the interrogation plan, and you may fail and be subjected to a post-test interrogation no matter what. Anything you say in the polygraph suite may be construed against you. You've got little to gain and potentially much to lose by agreeing to be interrogated without a lawyer. An important aspect of polygraph countermeasures, one that applies not just to the law enforcement pre-employment test used by law enforcement agencies, but also to the relevant or relevant test used by the CIA and NSA, and to the test for espionage and sabotage used by the Departments of Defense and Energy, is your behavior, your comportment inside the polygraph suite. Key is that you want to make no admissions, you don't want to sign any statements, and you want to make a good first impression by arriving on time, making eye contact with the polygraph operator, uh, being courteous and cordial. Uh, note in particular that it would be a mistake to attempt to discuss the scientific merits of polygraphy with your polygraph operator. The one tracing recorded by the polygraph instrument that you can directly control is breathing. Polygraph operators expect a person to breathe in and out between 15 and 30 times per minute. There are six breathing reactions that are recognized uh, by the National Center for Credibility Assessment as indicative of deception. So what you'd want to do is produce one such reaction whenever you recognize that it's a control question, not a relevant question or irrelevant question that is being asked of you. The first reaction is also the easiest to reproduce. When you're done breathing out, 
Just hold it for three to five seconds and then resume normal breathing. The second reaction is a decrease in breathing rate. When you recognize that the question being asked is a control question, just breathe slower for a few seconds and then resume with normal breathing. The third breathing reaction is a change in inhalation-exhalation ratio. This can be achieved by simply breathing out more slowly than you breathe in for a few seconds after you recognize that the question being asked is a control question, not a relevant or irrelevant question. The fourth breathing reaction is a decrease in amplitude, also called suppression. This can be accomplished by taking several shallower breaths and then returning to your normal breathing after a few seconds. The fifth breathing reaction is similar to the previous one, except that breathing gradually becomes shallower for a few seconds before returning to the baseline breathing uh, pattern. The sixth breathing pattern is a temporary increase in baseline. This can be accomplished by breathing in an extra bit of air and then continuing to breathe normally for a few seconds and then exhaling the extra volume of air again and resuming your normal breathing. An important thing to note is that none of these countermeasures involve deep breathing. Deep breathing is typically taken by polygraph operators as an indication of countermeasures used by the subject even though no one who understands polygraph procedure would actually attempt that. You can also produce reactions on the electrodermal and cardio channels through mental activity. You want to do this as soon as you recognize that the question being asked is a control question. Uh, for example, you can perform uh, mathematical calculations in your head as quickly as you can. You can pick an arbitrarily large number and count backwards by sevens or threes or any arbitrary number, again, as fast as you can. Or you can think exciting and particularly scary thoughts when the control question is asked. And again, maintain this for a few seconds. As an alternative to mental activity, you can also produce reactions by biting the side of your tongue uh, hard enough to produce moderate pain but not so hard as to cut your tongue. Again, you do this for a few seconds as soon as you recognize that the question being asked is a control question. Through the use of breathing manipulations, mental activity, or tongue biting, you can increase the chances that your reactions to the control questions will be stronger than any reaction to the relevant questions, thus increasing your chances of passing. Nonetheless, you may still be subjected to a post-test interrogation. When the relevant questions, uh, as well as the irrelevant questions, are being asked, you simply maintain your baseline breathing rate and relax. You should be on your guard against mind games that the polygraph operator may engage in with you. The uh, illustration you see here is of what's called a challenge coin produced by the United States Secret Service's polygraph unit. It depicts a winged flaming skull with a slogan, let the mind games begin. Ponder a moment the mentality of the people who produced this item. In any post-test interrogation, you should not try to explain alleged responses to relevant questions. This is a fishing expedition uh, seeking to get admissions. In particular, if you are asked what you were thinking about when a question was asked, your reply should simply be, I was thinking about the question and nothing more. Similarly, if asked which question bothered you the most, the correct answer is that none of them bothered you. If the post-test becomes accusatory, you are accused directly of lying or of withholding information, you should politely terminate the interrogation, and leave. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, can't polygraph operators detect countermeasures? Well, extensive documentation leaked to antipolygraph.org, including sensitive National Center for Credibility Assessment polygraph countermeasure documents, 
indicate that the polygraph community has no coherent strategy for detecting the kinds of countermeasures that I've discussed with you here today. You can review these documents for yourself on antipolygraph.org's Document Vault page. The federal polygraph community's concern about its inability to detect polygraph countermeasures is reflected by the fact that in the last decade, it launched a major criminal investigation targeting individuals who taught the public how to pass or beat a polygraph test. One of those individuals is Doug Williams of Oklahoma. Williams is a former polygraph operator who turned against polygraphy in 1979 and since then has been offering instruction on how to pass or beat the polygraph. Federal agents devised a sting operation to entrap him and he ended up serving two years in uh, federal prison. This is a picture of him after his release uh, from prison. Williams was under federal supervised release until a few days ago, and the terms of his release prevented him from engaging in any polygraph-related activity. However, tomorrow, August 1st, 2020, he'll be resuming his instruction uh, and lessons on how to pass or beat the polygraph. You can read more about his experience at polygraph.com. You can read more about polygraphy's scientific shortcomings, federal polygraph policy, polygraph procedure, and polygraph countermeasures in our free book, The Lie Behind the Lie Detector, which is available for download in PDF, EPUB, and Amazon Kindle formats. I'll now be happy to address your questions. If you're not able to get your question in in the limited time available, you can reach antipolygraph.org privately and securely via signal at area code 202-810-2105 or by email at antipolygraph.org at protonmail.com. We're also on Twitter at AP underscore ORG. Hey, thanks for that talk, George. It was really enlightening. So a quick question for you before we go into the live Q&A out of personal curiosity. How did you become so passionate, uh, such a passionate advocate regarding the perils of polygraphy? Well, I learned about it firsthand when I told the truth on an FBI pre-employment polygraph, but ended up being accused of lying anyway. Um, so that was in 1995, shortly after the FBI first began uh, polygraphing applicants. And I was a graduate student at the time at UCLA. So I went to the research library, uh, well, several, the medical library, the law library, and the general library, finding everything I could read about polygraphs. And I learned that it has no scientific basis, as um, is widely understood by psychologists. Um, and uh, so I, at the time, just continued with my life, uh, knowing that polygraphs didn't work. But about three years later, 1998, I discovered that what happened to me was happening to a lot of other people too, that the FBI in fact had a pre-employment polygraph failure rate at the time of 20%. Uh, so I felt compelled that I had to go public and share my experience with others. others. So I wrote at first a public statement about my experience, which you'll find on antipolygraph.org if you want to know all the gory details. Uh, go to the uh, personal statements page on antipolygraph.org, and the third statement is my own. Um, so, and since then, you know, in 1998, 20% failure rate for FBI applicants. That figure is now up mostly, most recently reported uh, on the order of 50%. Um, one former FBI agent told me that uh, in, I think in Utah, it was a failure rate of more like closer to 75%. So, so if um, that's the case, why are they still even used? Well, the government, U.S. government values the polygraph as a psychological tool for encouraging admissions. Uh, people go into the polygraph thinking that um, they need to divulge anything that might even be slightly embarrassing. Otherwise, 
they'll set off the machine and fail. So uh, for people who don't understand that it's a fraud, this can be very convincing. Uh, and they'll admit things to the polygraph operator that they've never told anyone else. So agencies like the CIA, FBI, NSA, they value the polygraph for that reason. And they can say, well, look, we hired this person who did such and such uh, a crime. I mean, we, we polygraphed and they admitted it. If we didn't do the polygraph, um, they, you know, we would have hired them and uh, think of all how bad that would be. But what's not considered in that is the negative utility. When you're using a, a test that's a fraud that doesn't work, what are the consequences? Well, one of them is that you're turning away well-qualified, honest applicants. You're making them distrustful of the government in, in the process. And uh, you're also treating your employees in a demeaning way by pretending to assess their honesty and character based on a, a fraud, as, which as I explained, actually depends on the operator lying to the person who's being tested and on that person remaining ignorant of polygraph procedure. So I think it makes for bad public policy. So a question from the audience. Have there been any major changes to the polygraph test post Snowden and have any of them been effective? To my knowledge, no. And uh, we've got the manuals uh, for uh, the most commonly used for formats like that law enforcement pre-employment test. The most recent manual we have published is from I think 2017 or 2016, which is post Snowden and there were no changes made to, to that. In fact, Calligraphy hasn't evolved in any significant way uh, in 60 years. It's uh, computerization didn't add any validity to the underlying procedure. Um, the use of directed live control questions, which is what the uh, Department of Defense and Department of Energy do, uh, also the US Customs and Border Protection, they're using, you're actually told to lie on the control questions to think about time when you did some behavior and then deliberately lie about it. Um, that, that technique is about 30 years old, um, but it didn't change any, anything fundamentally. And the standby technique, which I didn't go into in the presentation, but for the NSA and CIA is called the relevant irrelevant test. And that was taught to them by the polygraph pioneer, Leonard Keeler back, uh, back in the forties and fifties. And the technique has not changed in any uh, appreciable way since that time. I, su I suspect the reason it hasn't is because they're getting admissions and that's the purpose of the polygraph. So why change anything? They're just wow. doing more of them since Snowden. So another question from the audience. I've been told that it's not the polygraph that you have to beat, it's actually the polygraph operator. Even when the test itself is completed, the operator may still continue to ask questions that could expose the subject. What are your feelings about that? So I think that's a simplistic viewpoint to say you don't fool the polygraph, but the operator, because they actually do rely on the charts, especially in the law enforcement agencies like the FBI, uh, US Secret Service. Um, the chart readings are important. If you react strongly to a relevant question, you're going to fail even if the polygraph operator thinks that you seem sincere and might question if this was a false positive. So uh, it is important to convince the operator that you're telling the truth, though, because if he thinks you're not telling the truth, he can make you fail. Uh, there, there are ways, for example, by putting emphasis, if you were to use an accusatory emphasis when asking the relevant question, you could make a nervous reaction in the subject more likely to, to happen. So winning the trust of the polygraph operator is, is very important. And that's why um, if you look at our free book, The Lie Behind the Lie Detector, we devote a lot of time to uh, behavioral countermeasures, how to appear to be honest and truthful, how to avoid 
behaviors that polygraph operators and other interrogators are trained to believe are signs of deception. So, um, so both are important. The charts are important, uh, especially with the probable lie control question test, maybe less so with the relevant irrelevant test used by CIA and NSA, in which they use global scoring that polygrapher can make a subjective decision on whether um, whether to pass uh, a person or not. So another relative, more technical question for you from the public. What components of the interview are saved post-interview in a polygraph test? Wondering specifically about the OPM hack and if that data was stolen. So, what, so what's done with the polygraph results? Yeah, so it, within, I'm assuming that they mean that within the context of the polygraph test itself, you know, the information is collected, the graphs, the charts, all of that. What's actually saved post-interview and, and cached somewhere so that it... You know, to my knowledge, it's all saved by the polygraph unit of the agency involved. It costs little now to, to save that data. Um, and I believe it stays with the agency um, for a long time, for about as long as you know, they, they want to know if someone applies for employment with them, if they've been polygraphed before. So for decades, it, it will be retained by that agency. Um, the charts themselves, to the best of my knowledge, are not generally shared with other agencies. Um, they, they'll, I think, likely stay with that agency. However, uh, the results do get entered into databases. Um, and I'm not sure in, in what detail. There's two key ones for security clearances. One is called Scattered Castles, and the Department of Defense has one called JPass. Uh, so I think JPass will include polygraph pass or fail status and when. So for someone who's never had one taken, and a question from the audience member, what is the average length of a polygraph test? I mean, if you're subject to one, what should you expect? You should expect at least two hours for a pre-employment polygraph, maybe three. In some cases, it could go on six hours, but that's, that's not so common. Um, usually two to three hours is what you can expect. To, to spend with the polygraph operator. And so does that length of time have anything to do with the likelihood, likelihood that you're passing or not? I mean, will they extend out if if they think that you're saying well, something funny? So, so you'll, you'll have a very good idea whether you've passed or not based on whether you're subjected to a post-test interrogation. Because if, if the subject passes, then typically they're not interrogated, except again with the relevant irrelevant technique used by the CIA and uh, NSA, those agencies accuse almost everyone of deception on the first polygraph uh, session. And then they'll invite them back for a retest, maybe the next day. Uh, sometimes a few weeks later, they'll, they'll bring them back for you know, one or two more follow-up sessions where the interrogation continues. But with the FBI, the, the, the technique I talked about, the law enforcement pre-employment test, uh, if you're if you don't get a post test interrogation, it's a good sign you passed. If you do get the interrogation, then it'll go on longer. But again, I advise everyone don't stick around for that interrogation because you've got nothing to gain. That's the polygraph operator trying to justify his job to be able to say, "Look, this person failed my test, and I got this confession from him." In fact, they're they're rated based on the. Um, the number of confessions they get after a, a deceptive test. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they've got an incentive to to get you to confess, and um, uh, it, it creates a perverse inf incentive, in fact, for them to exaggerate anything that you tell them into to spin it into some sort of uh, disqualifying uh, admission. And then that it's becomes funny. a permanent federal record. It's funny to think that that, that whole process could generate you know, some sort of internal conspiracy type theory within the people who are taking the test. Yeah. So we've got just a minute or two left here. So a couple last questions. Does it feel sometimes that you're fighting an unwinnable battle 
in this process? And how can the Hope 20 hacker community help? What can we do to help? Okay, I think you can share what you know, I have learned uh, hopefully from, from my talk with other people. I think right now in the minds of the public, more polygraphs means more security. And as long as that delusion persists, politicians will have little incentive to reform the law. Um, so by, share, by sharing what you know with others, uh, that will help. And um, if I could clarify one thing in, in the little time we've got left, uh, when you take a polygraph with one federal agency, they will share the results with other federal agencies. And so you apply with the CIA, they call you a, a liar, reject you. If you later go to even the State Department, which does not polygraph, they will learn that you failed a polygraph with the CIA and it could adversely affect your chances of being hired there. All right, well, that's our time today, George. Thank you so much for your, your talk and this, this question and answer session. On behalf of all the HOPE 2020 attendees and presenters and volunteers, we really wanna thank you for sharing your passion with us today and enlighten us about this topic. And we look forward to seeing what you do next in your advocacy. So best of luck to you. Thank you, Toby. To everyone in the audience, please come back at the top of the hour